we are now going to welcome our next speaker. He is James Elrich, and he is the founder of Region Villages. James is going to talk about self-sustaining communities during pandemics. So I'm James Ehrlich. I'm founder of Regen Villages, which is a Stanford University spinoff company. Um, I just want to sort of let people know that there is absolutely a great deal uh, of cause to be optimistic that a regenerative and resilient uh, future is, is emerging and is upon us. Uh, because right now we have this this actual opportunity to to live this epiphany together. You can imagine for the first time in human history that um, everyone, every person on the planet is essentially experiencing the same thing at the same time. Uh, that's an opportunity for us to to look at solutions. So I am an entrepreneur in residence at Stanford University School of Medicine in the Stanford University Flourishing Project. I'm a senior fellow at NASA Ames Research Center, a faculty member at Singularity University, and under the Obama administration was appointed to a White House uh, State Department Joint Task Force on Regenerative Infrastructure. What I'd like to do is, is talk about um, this idea of living in uh, regenerative uh, resiliency with a hyper-local, what we call critical life support systems. This is based on uh, proven research in organic and biodynamic um, family farming and permaculture. And this idea that um, essentially we are improving our immune systems by having access and agency uh, with, with these natural resources uh, at our doorstep. And, and my research from his 15 years uh, catalogs this journey of eco-villages, intentional communities, uh, co-housing, co collaboratives, but mostly around uh, the idea of, of uh, farm-to-table experiences. When I came to Stanford in 2012, uh, because I also have a software background, a technology background in, in um, video games and special effects for motion pictures and, and other kinds of technology. Uh, I was really interested in this, this, this kind of marriage and idea of nature and software and what's possible for us to create the circumstances to improve thriving uh, mechanisms for how we live on the planet. So I was deeply inspired by the work of, um, of uh, Dr. Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia who had termed this wonderful idea of something called the Wood Wide Web, where she had discovered uh, in the Pacific Northwest that these grouping of trees were actually communicating with each other uh, in a collaborative economy, a long-term ledger of have need uh, network. Um, and that she proved basically that these nutrients, minerals, carbon, sugar, uh, water even, was being shared and conveyed under the forest floor in this beautiful symbiotic network. And, um, and that's this, this wonderful idea of, of these patterns in nature. 30% of our DNA is mycorrhizal, it's fungal. Um, it's the oldest living organism on earth. And if you look at these patterns in nature going all the way up to uh, the cosmological scale, they discovered a couple of years ago that whole galaxies are actually interconnected through these thin uh, electromagnetic dark matter fibers. And the truth that behind all of that is that it's a mesh network. It's a distributed uh, intelligence at the point of sensing. And so it's not a single brain processing and then sending information for, for systems to, to uh, deal with those that information or actuate on that information. It's actually being able to, at the point of sensing, make decisions and act on it. And, and I was really compelled with this idea of how could we live in neighborhoods of the future that have everything they need, essentially, food, water, energy, and, and converting uh, waste into asset classes, into resources. And that all those technologies and all those pieces actually exist 
and they work, but they've never been fully integrated or unified in um, using a, a light kind of software layer, an agnostic uh, layer of software. And, and the key thing we're really focusing on is, is this idea of safe, healthy, self-reliant communities. So it's not really kind of a political discussion about um, you know, libertarianism or socialism or communism or any of the isms. It's really about safety. And, and what's near and dear to our hearts at Regen Villages is this idea of uh, non-till uh, uh, soil farming that allows this inoculation of the mycorrhizal network to, to essentially communicate between all the different plants and cultivars. It's a very different economic model uh, behind farming because it's, it's intended for the neighborhood that it feeds plus the wider um, communities that surround that farm specifically. So not uh, big ag intended for trucking and, and flights and, and distribution under fluorescent light and refrigeration. Um, and we would argue that's more bioavailable uh, nutrition, right? And then part of that also is a mix between the soil-based farming and controlled uh, farming using aquaponics and aeroponics specifically. And that the uh, aquaponic systems are a grouping of freshwater shrimp, crawfish, six or seven different species of, of fish. And, and those creatures, their waste is actually um, ammonia. And then through a very light biological interaction, gets converted to nitrites and nitrates. That feeds the, the plant beds um, that are dangling, the roots are dangling in that, in that nutrient-rich water. And the water then comes back to the fish tanks, essentially purified. So it's, it's a, a way to save almost 80% um, in, in water for, for farming, controlled environment, and an increase almost one-third in, in biodiverse yield. And then if you couple that the soil-based farming and the controlled farming with what people can grow right next to their doorsteps, you start to get a picture of overproduction of healthy, delicious, life-affirming ingredients. That's all about, again, you know, safety. And one of the key things that we've been focusing on uh, for quite some time is how can we feed the fish, you know, feed the chickens and, and create a system where we don't have to buy um, uh, fish feed or animal feed, which are not healthy for those creatures or for us, right? So we looked at uh, the aquatic worms and the black soldier fly larvae, two non-invasive species that are pretty incredible because they're digesters. They eat their own weight um, every day in food and animal waste. And then they're the perfect food for the chickens and the fish and, and the small animals roaming around you know, the neighborhood. And what's even more beautiful about this whole system in terms of externalities is that their waste, the soldier fly and worm waste, is actually nutrient-rich, microbe-filled topsoil, which is gold. And that can be then spread back out across these really vast, wide areas of even gray field or brown field locations that's restorative. And this idea of restorative, regenerative, resilient permaculture is, is so fascinating and so beautiful because it's what Mother Earth is asking us for, right? And that's the basis of our metabolic map, right? That the integration where one system can feed into another, and it's really exciting. It's really a beautiful idea where um, the output of one system becomes the input of another, and that's the basis of our village operating system software, that we can create a, an agnostic layer of software, which can take that regenerative infrastructure and connect it to neighborhood facilities. So energy positive homes, external services like uh, mobility uh, that's autonomous eventually, curriculum, um, healthcare, and other kinds of systems and services. And we're using that software, the village operating system software, to do a few key things. The first is to define and design uh, regenerative neighborhoods, kind of like a Sim City model, um, on existing ranch and farmland. 
that we can show and prove to governments and landowners and stakeholders and communities especially that we can actually put hundreds of families onto open space without compromising the productive value of that land. Moreover, that it's um, uh, actually a support system that improves healthy outcomes for the people who live in that new build community. Then the same software that's the village operating system software for designing and defining the village is then the mechanism that actually runs the finished built community. So it's this opportunity to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to create a mesh network, a distributed uh, neural network essentially of sentient neighborhoods that are uh, communicating with each other and improving each other based on where they are in climate zones. And it's a really beautiful model for the future of our species living on planet Earth within nature and not separate from it. That this idea that we can create these kinds of incredibly vibrant, resilient communities, uh, multicultural, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomic level, now coming out of a post-COVID world, we hope uh, in the short uh, proximate future, um, and that people can enjoy living in this place their whole life. They can age in place. We can reimagine uh, this land into migrating uh, bird estuaries and pollinators and get back to a place about celebrating seasonality. And you start to really get this picture of a master plan concept uh, that is all about the happy longevity. And that's the reason why at Stanford University at the flourishing uh, project that I am my affiliation with, in addition to running Regen Villages, which is a separate um, a Dutch holding company, is this complete idea around how we can uh, essentially overcome pandemics in the future by helping to spread humanity out into these lily pads of very beautiful, primarily uh, agricultural based neighborhoods. And those systems are there for us to support us. Of course, there's a certain amount of future tech that can be embedded, whether that's autonomous vehicles and peripheral parking, the two way EV charging and battery storage, drone deliveries, drone taxis. And uh, really, what's most important to us is how can we put social housing? In a, in a pretty good percentage, um, over 35, 40% or even more into the mix um, and create these beautiful kinds of low rise apartment, let's say, which on each floor you have co-living space. So shared living room, shared kitchens, uh, uh, rooftop garden access, atrium access. And of course, even if you're in a social unit, but you have access to the full community. We've looked, of course, at this idea of the tiny house movement, which is also for extreme affordability, <clears throat> the the row houses of threes and fours uh, for you know essentially um, you know townhome and and condominium living, uh, the semi-detached, so full services on the ground floor for seniors and those with with disabilities, and that even the villas uh, aren't just for high rollers; they're also for a micro mortgage program. Um, and rental for groups of people who want to live together, but but in bigger spaces. And um, we're quite interested in this idea of of building um, using circular natural building materials in ways that are uh, prefabricated. It saves time and energy, and especially construction waste, which is really uh, um, a terrible thing to be wasting one third of of construction material. Uh, for every single house that you build. Um, also, we've been looking quite a lot at extrusion of, um, of uh, different kinds of earthen materials so that can be 3D printed. And as that 3D printing happens, we can look at other building materials, for instance, like hemp Crete, which is a beautiful planet-friendly substitute for cement. And it uses hemp and lime and water and creates very beautiful, very stable, uh, seismic proof, fire retardant, pest resistant, uh, mold resistant kinds of structures. 
uh, and of course that these can be crafted into very, very beautiful kinds of, of homes and dwellings. We can look at city and urban uh, retrofits, and this is something that we've looked into uh, a bit in our, into our research. It is something that can be uh, sort of added to a residential tower. And if this residential tower happens to have adjacency with open space, that building itself could potentially become self-sufficient. And that's you know, quite interesting for the new urban considerations. This is an example of an eco-village um, in uh, uh, just south of Chennai, India, in a very arid location. The images on the left are from the mid-1970s. The images on the right are from today. It, they have completely restored, just a few people, uh, completely restored almost 2,200 hectare of, of uh, greenery. And, and that planting is now its own microclimate. It brings its own rain. 3,000 now residents live there year round and they have almost a half a million visitors each year. So the idea behind Regen Villages, we are a Dutch holding company. It's a Stanford spinoff company that I founded in 2016. We uh, have incredible outreach all around the world. This is a globally scalable, replicable model to build and implement these kinds of self-reliant neighborhoods around the world um, using software, but also where technology is really a means to an end. And so these are amazing locations all around the world. Uh, we have a garnered global media coverage. I'd like to say we're kind of like the rolling stones of, of the modern eco-village movement. And yes, uh, sure. I wanted to ask you if you want to take one question, people have written questions sure. in the chat. We have time for one question. Maybe you choose it. Sure. No problem. And I just put this slide there because that's where um, you know my my email is. It's James at Regen Villages, regenvillages.com, uh, or James E at Stanford uh, dot, dot edu. So I'm happy to answer a question. Okay, so let's choose one here at random. What do you think is the most important hurdle for these regenerative communities to hit mainstream? Uh, the bottom line is mainstream is not the issue. Uh, we, we've, we've tapped into literally almost 90 million uh, people around the world so far who are compelled and love the vision. That's not the issue. The issue is really two things. It's money and political will. And, and we believe right now that there's institutional money, government money, that's ready to invest literally trillions in this green transition. Uh, you look at EU um, and, and you look at, at Canada and, and New Zealand and South Korea. These are all countries that are committing sovereign wealth to rethinking economic models and new ways forward. So we're really, we th feel like we're synaptically close right now. Um, however, we do, we are raising money. We're in a series A round right now, and we're definitely looking for like-minded um, impact family offices and investors to hop on board. Um, we've got great technical partners and we're really ready to make this happen. Maybe you can have some networking sessions later. Uh, I'm really looking forward Ooh. to that. So, you know, regen, regenvillages.com. Uh, I'll just put that into chat right Perfect. here. And um, also uh, my email, which is uh, james at regenvillages.com. Awesome. And... I'm that is how people can get to me directly. Thank you very much for your talk. I have to welcome our next speakers. Have a great day, James. Thank you.